Local colleges, including BC, are dealing with new instances of racism on campus. Those stories and all the day's news starting at 4 on GBH's All Things Considered. And you're listening to hour number two of Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Hello again, Jim. Uh, hello again, Marjorie. You know, we may never know what was in the letter that Trump left for the newly sworn in President Biden. What we do know is what wasn't in that letter, a vaccine distribution plan. On that front, the Biden administration inherited no plan at all, forcing states to figure it out on their own. In Massachusetts, that meant navigating what even the governor called early on a bumpy vaccine rollout. For the first couple of weeks, we were ranking in the bottom half of U.S. states in vaccinating people. But uh, the numbers have improved dramatically in recent days. In fact, we're near the top in per capita vaccinations, particularly amongst larger states. Starting today, as you know, the criteria for who qualifies the schedule of vaccine is expanded, making an additional 1 million people in our state eligible. That includes people 65 or older, anyone with two or more comorbidities, which may explain the crash of the site this morning. Governor Baker joins us in line to talk about all this and other vaccine distribution developments. Governor, we're really glad to hear from you. Welcome back to the show. Thanks, guys. Um, you know, someday I hope to be back in the studio yeah. um, because, honestly, um, it's a little more fun to do it when I can actually see your faces when you ask me questions and, um, and especially when I respond to them. <laughs> we know what you mean, Governor. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's much harder to tell exactly what you're thinking. <laughs> well, we look forward well, to it, too. We're hoping. We're really hoping. But, Governor, as, as Jim just said, things have improved dramatically in the last couple of days. So I was going to start with that. But then uh, we had this crash this morning of the, of the website, just as the people uh, 65 and over and, and people with two comorbidities could begin signing up. So what happened? Well, obviously, people are in the process of, of figuring that out and getting the site back up and operating. Um, people did a lot of scenario work, um, which is pretty typical of what you do before you expect a big surge in activity. And obviously, the scenario work that was done didn't adequately prepare the site for what happened when um, 8 o'clock rolled around this morning. And, and I, you know, my hair's on fire about the whole thing. I can't even begin to tell you how pissed off I am and um, and people are, are working really hard to get it fixed and um, and we know how important it is for people uh, to have it fixed and to be able to access all those new appointments that went up on it. Um, there are about 20,000 appointments at Danvers and uh, Bristol and in Dartmouth and in um, uh, Springfield that went up that have been filled. Um, there are another 50,000, however, that haven't gone up yet because they need to go up when the site gets fixed. And there's a lot of other appointments that are also available there. And um, it's going to get fixed as fast as it needs to get fixed. And, and like I said, people did a lot of work preparing for this, but clearly they didn't do enough. And um, and I I know how important it is to people to get their shots. And it's part of the reason why um, we started with some very hard to reach populations, which put us a little bit in the hole in terms of the national um, the national race on, on, on vaccine productivity. But that's part of the reason why we got so aggressive about, um, about working to catch up. And, and as Jim pointed out, we've made a lot of progress in the last two or three weeks. But um, this is not satisfactory. It's not even, it's awful and it's going to get fixed. And you know, I'm 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 going to work very hard to make sure it doesn't happen again. Governor, just to clarify, those 50,000 appointments that generally would pop up or become available on a Thursday that have not yet been posted, I assume they're mostly or all at Gillette and uh, and Fenway. Is that correct? I think so. Okay. Um, and they won't be posted until people can actually access them. Understood. You know, uh, Governor, I, we have uh, uh, you've taken a lot of criticism, by the way, in the spirit of candor from us as well. And I've listened pretty carefully to every response you've given. And in my new pandemic mode where I try to listen more respectfully to people. Wow. I know. I, that isn't the new me. I understand most of your arguments, even those with which I don't agree. The one that I haven't heard a decent explanation on yet is we spoke to a Jake Auchincloss uh, at the top of the show today. He and nine other members of the uh, delegation, everybody except Virginia, sent you a letter saying, 
we need a centralized pre-registration system a la, you know, one of the poorest states, West Virginia, uh, which would essentially, once you register, shift the burden to the state to notify people when they're eligible. Then I read that the firm that developed the website is actually in Burlington, Massachusetts. So why haven't we moved in that direction, Governor Baker? No, we are looking at uh, we are looking at that, um, and, uh, and we'll probably have more to say about it as um, over the course of the next few weeks. The the big um, I won't get into the the nitty gritty of the details. It's different to do this. It's just we have way more sites, a lot more people. It's a little more complicated to, to set this up in Massachusetts the way you would set it up in a, in a smaller state, but. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think uh, it's it's a it's a topic of uh, of conversation and discussion among our team, and, and I'm hoping we'll have more to say about it shortly before we get into some of the really big population groups. We're talking. Which I'm about hoping the... we'll have enough vaccine to get into at some point um, in the next, hopefully, you know, four to six weeks. The other thing I would say, and I, I said this yesterday, is we are still only allowed to order one week's worth of vaccine. And if the feds would give us permission to order three weeks worth of vaccine, then we could give people a three week window into scheduling appointments. And, um, and this is something we have asked the delegation to raise with the administration, because I do think they, they claim that they have a pretty good window at this point into you know, what the next three weeks or so are gonna look like. I think it'd be great if they would tell us so that we could with some certainty then make decisions about how to allocate at least the vast majority of what the next three weeks worth of vaccine would look like and then hold some of it back depending upon sort of what happens to make sure that we don't run out anywhere. Um, But then we could literally extend the um, enrollment period more than a week and and put it out there two or three weeks, um, which I think would make it easier for people to both plan and also to schedule appointments. Governor Baker, there's one thing I think lots of people, including myself, are kind of confused about, and I suspect it has to do with not knowing the availability of vaccines. But what I've been reading is that the, the latest group, people who are 65 or older or who have two comorbidities, they could be waiting at least a month before they can book their first appointment. So does that mean that they could be on the website repeatedly trying to book for the next several days until they can do it? Or what does that mean? Well, I mean, remember, we only get one week's worth of orders, right? Yep. And as um, as several people have pointed out, um, we're sort of in a bit of limbo at the moment about supply, given some weather issues in uh, in the Mid Atlantic region. Um, but with one week worth of orders, you know, we'll get a hundred and twenty thousand doses for the next order. And that's what we're supposed to get anyway, is 120,000 doses for the next week. That means um, 120,000 people can sign up for a first dose. You have a very big universe here um, of people who are eligible, although I would argue that um, we don't know what percentage of the over 65s or the two comorbidities are the same person. Right. All right? There's yeah. probably There's probably some overlap there. Um, so... It will take a while. So, so if, you have, if you only have 120, th- this is why if I had three weeks worth of appointments, it would make it a lot mm-hmm. easier for people to sign up. But I can't, I can't commit to anything more than what I can get the feds to commit to. And at this point, that's a week. So okay. 120,000 appointments will get booked um, based on those 120,000 first doses. And, uh, and those folks will then you know, automatically be uh, hopefully scheduled to come back to get their second dose three or four weeks later. Um, but then the following week I get another 120 and the following week, another 120 okay. and hopefully, you know, the, the Biden folks have said they're getting more and more visibility into where they can go and how much they can do. And, and honestly, you know, the, the J and J vaccine, which is a one dose instead of a two dose is going to be before the FDA next week. And, you know, I can tell you every governor in America is praying that that thing gets approved because having a third manufacturer producing vaccine would make a giant difference with respect to how fast we can go. We get 450,000 requests for vaccine from providers who can provide vaccine in Massachusetts a week for our 120,000 first doses. So 
we have a lot of capacity. And that's one of the reasons why I think everybody is so frustrated, because there's a lot more capacity out there to deliver shots than we actually have vaccine that we can deliver for giving shots. So if the feds could, you know, approve a third vac third company to produce vaccine and actually not just incrementally increase what they give us every week, but dramatically increase what they give us every week, um, that would make a big difference. I don't want to dash your hopes, but I'm sure you know more about this than I. But Dr. Fauci was saying yesterday that on the Johnson & Johnson front, that yes, they will meet their obligation to the federal government, but uh, the supply from them will be overwhelmingly backloaded, meaning they'll meet their obligation by the summer, but the vast majority of those shots are not going to be made available, doses, until uh, uh, the summer. I hope, obviously, that doesn't happen. Governor, I want to stay on the scheduling thing. I will say, I'm sorry. I will say though, that they've been, they've been back and forth. I mean, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of back and forth coming out of Washington for a while over, mm -hmm. you know, when they believe supply is going to outstrip um, available capacity. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to make of of, of some of that. Um, and and honestly, all I can do is is plan based on what's available. Yeah. You know? Go Governor Baker, the next obviously, I assume everybody's memorized this. The next group of people, uh, when you get to them after the current new eligibles as of uh, this morning, are essential workers, which includes teachers. There is no issue on which we've taken calls the last few months, and I'm sure it's the same for you that has been more charged than school openings and we i think everybody knows what your position is but in the last i guess 36 hours uh, the speaker of the house who in his first interview said he had no idea what was going on with the rollout which i found to be odd since he was on your vaccine advisory committee said two days ago that he wanted teachers to move to the front of the line i assume that meant in the same grouping as the 65 pluses and the two comorbidities what's your reaction to what he and not just him, but others have uh, said about uh, teachers moving beyond the essential worker category. So um, there was a big push, I'm sure you remember this, about a month ago. I think it was a month. It might have been three weeks um, from the CDC yeah. to prioritize 65 plus um, and people with two comorbidities. I mean, they really, they really made this a... It was right on the edge of a campaign, which is unusual for the CDC. And uh, and and based on that guidance um, and a lot of uh, input from from people in the in the medical community around here, we moved them um, to the top of uh, you know it's kind of the second slot in phase two. Um, teachers are part of the first group of working people, right, who are in. Uh, in line after that, and so that's with you know transit workers and grocery workers mm -hmm. and um, and 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 a whole host of other people who are in in fields that people felt were important to get vaccinated. But um, you know, I I do think it's important to remind people that um, the Commonwealth next week is going to start a pooled testing program. I think it's the first in the nation for school districts and schools that will test every week um, the adults and the kids in classrooms. And we've had hundreds of school districts and schools that are very interested in doing this. And we're actually very excited about the possibility here of being able to make a regular week weekly testing program available for these folks, a uh, 24-hour turnaround. You can use the, the rapid testing stuff if somebody comes back positive. Um, to confirm right away, and um, and I do think it's a, a pretty good uh, tool to provide people with comfort um, as they as the Commonwealth and hopefully the supply from the Feds gets bigger and we work through uh, the 65 and, and comorbidity crew. I mean, keep in mind here that part of the reason why the CDC um, made those changes was because this population in particular is enormously vulnerable mm -hmm. to COVID. It's why we spend so much time on long-term care and on SNFs, and it's why we spend time on all the congregate care type facilities, you know, homeless shelters, group homes for people with developmental disabilities, correctional facility, um, uh, group homes for people with mental, uh, mental illness and their staffs. I mean, those are, those are, for all intents and purposes, the folk that, folks that many folks were primarily concerned about with respect to 
the vulnerability issue and um and i'm you know i'm anxious to working through these working through these um through these phases too but we are offering schools i think a very valuable tool that many i anticipate will sign up for based on the enthusiasm we've seen so far to start uh getting back in the classroom governor a lot of politicians including congress people and their staff have been vaccinated have you been vaccinated nope how come i'm not old enough I'm so you're waiting enough. so you're waiting for group 3 uh i'm 64 so i would come um Group three. No, I right. think I'm part of the general population, aren't I? I come I think after we yeah. get through the. I come yeah. after we get through all the all the employers. That is phase three. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, phase wait three. Wait a second. You feel but like you, you are 64, but don't you feel like 84 after this? <laughs> longest longest year of my life, no question. You know, <laughs> everybody said, "Oh, governor, you know, 28 days of snow, Merrimack Valley gas explosions, <laughs> bomb tornadoes on the Cape at the big of the beginning of the tourism season, ice storms in Western Mass." <laughs> Your last couple of years are going to be a breeze. Yeah. <laughs> last well, couple of years. That's well, interesting. That's the way people put it to me most of the time, Jim. Okay. okay. Well, well, Governor, this has been, um, uh, uh, I mean, you have been a Teflon governor, as it were, you know, leading the nation in popularity and stuff. And this is really the first time you've taken extended, repeated hits. How hard has that been? So um, I get a lot of mail. Yeah. And I've gotten a lot of mail since the start of the pandemic. Um, a lot of people, it turns out that my press availabilities over the spring and summer were every bit as popular as The Price is Right. Um, and <laughs> I got an unbelievable amount of incoming mail of all kinds about all sorts of decisions that I made. And, um, and the agony and the pain and the suffering and the tumult and the crisis that COVID and some of the decisions we had to make to deal with it has created for people makes any of the rockiness that those of us in public life might have to deal with feel like nothing by comparison. You read these letters, some cases I called some of these people, um, just breaks your heart. And I think I think it's really important for those of us who have a job, all right, who haven't lost our business, our life's work, um, who still have a grandparent or a parent that we can still visit, even if we have to wear masks and we can only do it once a week and it has to be with an appointment. Um, the This thing is so brutal and, and and I and I think sometimes in the in the sword play of politics, what's really going on with regular people kind of gets lost. And I I am I have I have a job that's way more complicated than I thought it was going to be. Okay, and um, and people you know have all sorts of thoughts about how well I'm doing it or how well I'm not doing it. That is nothing compared to. Um, people who've lost everything just because they were on the wrong side of the COVID arc when um, all hell broke loose last March. And I think it's really important for those of us in public life to remember that. Governor Baker, I know you're on a short leash today. Before you go, I know you've spoken a lot about the equity concerns and from getting the infection to getting the vaccine, people who've been on the wrong end of the stick in the healthcare system, people of color, low-income people are seeing it exacerbated here. I know you expanded to these 20 so-called socially vulnerable communities yesterday. I know earlier on you talked about extra doses up to 20 percent to some of these underserved, uh, overly negatively impacted communities. Is there more on the equity front that you can and will do to try to balance the scales? Yeah, I think the, I mean, first of all, um, you know, we've been tracking how we're doing in vaccinating um, um, our black residents, um, our brown residents, Asians, you know, sort of all the various communities. And, and, and we've collected a bunch of data on that. And one of the big problems is there's a big unknown in there, you know, where people either don't tell you or you, or you can't tell, you know. So we've been doing some work trying to um, figure out we, we do know the zip codes where most people live, but we're trying to figure out if we can take some of the zip code data and apply it in a way that would be consistent with what we would learn from this. Um, 
so that we can get a better sense on how we're doing. Uh, because obviously, at the end of the day, part of the measurement here is, you know, were you able to get people vaccinated? Um, and part of the reason we put home health aides in early and personal care assistants in early was because many of those people are people of color, and they work with, in many cases, people who are people of color who are dealing with comorbidities of one kind or another or other medical things. It's one of the reasons why, even though the feds run the skilled nursing facility program, we were all over them about making multiple trips to, the, to visit these facilities to get as many staff as we possibly could vaccinated because there's a bunch of folks who work in those facilities who are people of color. Same thing with um, the disability, um, the people with developmental disabilities in group homes, the people with mental health issues in group homes, and the people with um, who are um, who are homeless and in shelters. One of the, re and the and the and the correctional facilities. I mean, there's a lot of people of color who work in many of those places and uh, and who are residents or or inmates in those places. And our goal was to try to make sure we got as many of those folks vaccinated as we could. And we've been very aggressive in our outreach with our community health center partners, and we've provided them with resources. And I, you know, I think. I think we'll probably end up with many of these communities working with them to try to create literally campaigns around vaccine, around vaccinations and uh, and finding ways to work with some of the trusted partners in their communities to encourage people to get vaccinated. But I, I think this is a really important issue and it's one we really need to focus on. And the one thing I would say to your folks, and I would urge others who have opportunities to speak to this, if you've already had COVID, that doesn't mean you don't need a vaccine, right. all right? I mean, one of the biggest challenges we have here is in many of these communities, a lot of people got COVID, right? And so a lot of them think, I got COVID, I'm okay, because that's generally been sort of the, the, the short-term message around this stuff. But as these different variants show up, and as they turn out to be, um, in some cases, um, able to, um, to give somebody COVID for a second time who already had it, it's really important for everybody to get vaccinated. And just because you had it um, really isn't enough of, a, of, a, of protection against the possibility of getting it again. And we've been working that message really hard, and we're going to continue to work it. But, but I do think in the end you're going to see us working with some of these com communities and some of the community health centers and some of the other uh, community-based organizations on stuff that's going to look like almost the equivalent of a political campaign. Governor, Governor we really appreciate your time. Yeah, Thanks thank so much. Thank you very much. Good luck All with right, everything. Folks, take care. Yep, bye-bye. You, Be you well. too. That was the voice of Governor uh, Charlie Baker, and we thank him very much. In about 20 minutes, we're going to open up the lines and take your phone calls on the vaccine, how it's going for you, how it's going for your parents, your grandparents. But right now, we're going to talk with Meet the Press Chuck Todd to go over the latest headlines out of Washington, D.C. and Texas. This is 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio.